all you people, yeah. so many. Woo. All right, uh, my name is Seth Breedlove, and I am the, um, the director of the movie that we're showing tonight, The Mothman of Point Pleasant, which is about this town, this town that we're in right now, the, uh, Point Pleasant. How many people in the crowd are from Point Pleasant? Woo. This is, so this is mostly out of town, though. Raise your hand if you're not from Point Pleasant. <laughs> so if you're from Point Pleasant, I want you to take that in because that's a big deal. Like this is a little town and there are people from all over the country, possibly the world, that came here because of the Mothman. Okay, so that's, that's something that we're, we're learning and I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight is, is the whole crypto tourism and, and cryptids and their importance. For, for small communities. Um, how many people in attendance are aware of small town monsters and what we do? Okay, well, it's funny because I have a little section here where I'm, I'm now about to talk about what small town monsters is, but so many of you know. Um, small town monsters is an independent film series made by myself, um, Zach down in the front row, raise your hand, Jason over there, Brandon, and then occasionally we can get the, the big cheese Lyle Blackburn involved to narrate or in the, in the case of Boggy Creek Monster actually be in our films. Um, and I, I want you guys to understand too, if you're a filmmaker in the audience and you've, you've always wanted to make movies, it's important to note that we started out with, with camcorders um, planning to make a film that was going to be uh, shown on YouTube for free and it kind of morphed into this little independent film series and we're able to travel around the country and, and take on different stories that we re really want to tell. Um, the, the, one of the big things about Small Town Monsters is our approach to the subject. It's different from a lot of what you'll see on TV. Um, we, we tend to be a little more ground level and um, we usually are not running through the woods screaming and, and banging on trees and stuff. Although, maybe behind the scenes that happens. I'm not sure. Um, so anyway, Small Town Monster started with Minerva Monster in 2015, followed up by Beast of Whitehall in 2016, followed up by Boggy Creek Monster in 2016, followed up by the Mothman of Point Pleasant in June, and that is followed up on October 20th by our next film, Invasion on Chestnut Ridge. We've got others coming, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, it, it started as a, as a book proposal. That's how Small Town Monsters began its life, was as a book proposal. I, I put it together mostly to tell these little local legends. Stories like the Mothman uh, were, were part of the book proposal that I had planned on submitting to publishers. Funny story, we, we sent that original book proposal to a lot of different publishers. One of the first uh, wrote back, and I actually just found this rejection letter the other day. He told me, um, it is, it's just not original enough, and it's not something I can ever see as publishing. Um, later next year, we're going to be publishing that book under his, uh, pub <laughs> yeah, under, under that press, which is kind of humorous to me. But Small Town Monsters Began Its Life as this very small thing and has, has become something bigger, and that's all rooted in stories we love, stories like The Mothman. And obviously, I grew up in a town called Bolivar, Ohio, and in Bolivar, we didn't have really a local monster, but down the street, there was a town called Mineral City, and in that city, city, it's, it's a town of about 300 people, um, they had something they called Minnie the Monster, and Minnie the Monster was a, a Bigfoot-like creature that lived in an old abandoned railroad tunnel, and apparently it was a spot where kids would drive up and, and neck you know, and if you did such a terrible thing, many of the monster would come charging out of the railroad tunnel and would supposedly beat your car with rocks, possibly kill you. Um, and that was Minnie the Monster, and that was our local legend. And what I found out over time is that every single town all around the country has their own little legendary stories. And, and that's the, the story began its life in that way. We wanted to tell. Uh, all these little legends from around the country. We wanted to tell them in the way we want to see them told, not the way that network television likes to tell them, which is with bad actors and fake blood and boobs and all that kind of stuff. That wasn't, that wasn't our storytelling mode. So, it began life with Minerva Monster, and, and that story kind of ballooned. What, what shocked us was when Minerva Monster 
um, came out as a film, as, as people started to talk about it, it kind of went um, viral locally, where we were. And the story was about this Bigfoot sighting that took place back in 1978. There was this one family, the Caton family, and they kept having encounters with this glowing-eyed creature that would come up behind their house and throw rocks at their roof and occasionally just kind of terrorize the family. And then one night, uh, they found their dog, a German Shepherd, ripped from its leash with its neck snapped. And the story went to, they, they called the police, and when the police came out, they reported it to the local newspapers. And one of the local newspaper reporters came out and investigated the story, and that story got published in a newspaper that got picked up by the AP Wire. The Associated Press took it, and from there it went kind of global. The story became very important in the town of Minerva during that summer, not in a positive way necessarily. Uh, the town was kind of hounded, or the, the family that saw the creature was kind of hounded for claiming they had seen the creature. And there was, there was some really negative connotations connected with having seen the creature. But what we found out when we went back to document that story is that the town had kind of forgotten about this over time. And because of that, when we made our film, it was like this whole new gateway opening up for especially younger kids in the area. They'd never heard of the Minerva Monster. I think, I'm not mistaken, when Jeff Walmsley really dove into the Mothman legend, he did the same thing here. He did it on a much larger scale than anything we have managed with Minerva Monster. But it's, it's worth paying attention to the fact that that happened all around the country. There are, there are little legends in your town, or stories, whatever you want to call them, folk tales, however you want to refer to them, that have a major impact on the community for a short period of time. And then for the most part, they're forgotten. And the reason that is, is a lot of people don't take Bigfoot stories or Mothman stories or ghost stories very seriously. But whether or not you believe there's actually a creature doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. What, what matters is it does have a huge impact on the local culture and the people who live in that town. For a little while, in 1978, everyone in Minerva was talking about the Minerva monster. In 2015, when we made the movie, no one had a clue what the Minerva monster was, which is sad because that's a key piece of that family's history. So I didn't name this talk. That's a, it's a little behind the scenes thing. Ashley Wamsley named the talk, and she named it well because it's, it's something like turning monsters into time capsules. And that's what we're doing at the end of the day when we make these movies. We're preserving a piece of history that might be either forgotten or relegated to some you know, library shelf somewhere or, or some microfilm. When I say every town has their own legend, it's, it's really true. We found stories all around the country, the Monroe, Michigan monster, the Loveland frog, they, they, they're all over. And they're not just like one type of creature. There's all these weird creature reports. And again, this doesn't mean, just, just enjoying these stories, learning about these stories, doesn't mean you have to believe there was a Loveland frog or the lizard man or what have you. It means that you're acknowledging the importance of that story in the community where it took place. I think all of you guys that are here tonight can easily look around Point Pleasant and see that this is a very important story in the history of this town. It plays a major role. The thing I keep saying about that that's, that's worth noting is, is the fact that Point Pleasant has this really rich, fascinating history going, you know, back to the Revolutionary War and French and Indian War and all that kind of stuff. And yet, more so than any of that, it is known for a glowing red-eyed monster that chased some kids back during the 60s. That's, that's important, you know, and, and the, the question that keeps coming up to me is why is that? Why is this such an important part of this town's history? Why are these monster stories you know, why, are they, why do they tend to be such an important part of the history of whatever town they're taking place in? I don't really have an answer, but I think part of it lies in the fact that the world is a really crappy place currently, and people love, absolutely love, the idea of going out in the woods and looking for something that everyone else claims doesn't exist. There's something very innocent that takes us back to our childhood about these stories and these legends. And I think that is a key part of what is going on here. 
Um, our, our approach, again, tends to be to talk to the original witnesses, to let the original witnesses tell their story. Sometimes we have difficulty with that. In the case of the Mothman movie you're about to see tonight, a lot of the original witnesses have passed away. So what we had to do was, in a couple cases, actually we were granted uh, original audio taped interviews. A lot of documentaries might shy away from using solely audio to tell that story, but uh, we tend to embrace that sort of thing because in a lot of these cases, there are, aren't video interviews with those people. So in Mothman and Point Pleasant, we have audio taped interviews with Bob Bosworth and, and a lot of these people who have since passed away. Um, and we, we also have a Marcella Bennett uh, video interview and that kind of thing. We, as best as we can, it is part of our mission to preserve these stories in the words of the original witnesses. When that doesn't happen, we're trying to verify the stories as best we can and put them you know, in, in words that we think don't over sensationalize the sightings. It's hard not to sensationalize the Mothman story, by the way, because this is a, but even by Minerva Monster standards, this is a very outlandish story. You know, it begins with these kids in this car uh, encountering this, this glowing red-eyed demon that chases them on this this road late at night, you know, at high speeds, and it blows up into a local, you know, kind of uh, juggernaut, cultural juggernaut. And before you know it, there's posses out in the woods trying to hunt for the monster. Here's the funny thing about all that, though. The, that, that carries across almost all of these stories that we're telling. In Minerva in 1978, after the Minerva monster was seen, people started going out in the woods with beer and shotguns <laughs> hunting for the Minerva monster. In fact, it got so ridiculous, so over the top, that there were actually so many hunters lined up and down the Lincoln Highway in their cars, parking their, their trucks and stuff off the side of the road, that they actually had to shut down the Lincoln Highway, go up, the, the sheriff had to round up as many you know, volunteers as he could. They had to go up into the woods around the Caton family's home and run the drunken hunters out of the woods to get their cars so people could move back and forth up and down the road again. So um, there's always posses. That's, that's huge. Uh, there's always newspaper reports. And then that blows up and become more and more people claiming they've seen something. And they follow a pattern. And one of the most important things for us is finding stories that aren't simply a couple people in the woods see something. We're, we're looking for stories that impact the town in a major way and either continue to do so, or if they don't continue to do so, we like to explore why they aren't. Why, why are these stories not being talked about still today? Um, the tourism aspect of this, I touched on real briefly, is a huge part of it. Uh, the, 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 if you look around Point Pleasant, I'm, I'm not bashing the town, but I don't know what the tourism would have been prior to this. There probably were some history buffs that loved coming down because of Tuendui and, and Fort Randolph and all that, and that stuff's awesome. But I think the biggest draw, tourism-wise, in town now is the Mothman. And that holds true for a lot of different towns. That holds true for Fal Arkansas and uh, the... the even Minerva now, we, we host a, a yearly Minerva Monster Day event each year. Um, you're invited, by the way. It's, it's next, uh, next June. Just keep it on your calendar. Um, so it's the, embracing these stories is important simply to continuing to help the, the town financially. Uh, small towns are drying up around the United States. And as crazy as it might seem, <laughs> tourism and crypto tourism play a huge part in keeping these communities alive and, and offering a lifeblood to them. Um, so, so what's next? So right now we just finished the Mothman of Point Pleasant. And the Mothman of Point Pleasant um, obviously just tells the story of the Mothman. After that we did Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, which is a look at a bizarre stretch of 72 mile mountain range in Pennsylvania where basically since the, the 1950s there have been UFO sightings and, and Bigfoot sightings and strange lights in the forest and dogmen and large prehistoric birds. 
And it was a different kind of story for us to tell because instead of focusing on one monster in one location, we're telling the story of multiple monster encounters along this huge 72 mile expanse of land. Um, that movie comes out October 20th and it's very exciting. We're excited about that one. Following up that is the Flatwoods Monster, uh, A Legacy of Fear, which is based again here in West Virginia. And that comes out next April. That's followed up by On the Trail of Champ, which is uh, more of a look at the research aspect of looking for monsters. So that actually takes you into the water looking for Champ. And also a really deep dive, no pun intended, into the long history of sightings of Champ in you know that area of Vermont, New York. Um, and then following that is Bray Road Beast, which is the first film in our Monsters of the Midwest trilogy, which starts next October. And we've got stuff planned through 2020. So we're gonna continue telling these stories. And, and there's multiple reasons, but at the end of the day, I just really enjoy making movies with my friends and um, getting to be a part of things like the Mothman Festival. So we're, we're gonna show the movie and we're gonna do a Q&A afterward. So I don't wanna take too many questions, but if anyone has any questions directly relating to small town monsters or the making of movies, you can, you can yell at me. Anyone? Anything? Yes? It's one of my favorites because it was basically proven to be a hoax. Um, in, in the 70s, there was a teenager um, who dressed in a, a, a costume and would accost drivers along this one a stretch of road uh, in Monroe, Michigan. And, and including one night, I guess he actually stuck his arm in a car window and grabbed a woman's face. She had to go to the hospital. Um, and it, 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 what was interesting about that story, the reason I say, the reason I say it's one of my favorites isn't because it was proven to be a hoax. It was, it was fascinating to watch the story and to discover it for myself. I had never heard of the Monroe monster either. And I found it through looking through old microfilm, like newspaper archives. Um, and the story basically you could track it from like this one little police blotter in the paper into this huge kind of cultural thing that was going on across Monroe where all these people were claiming to see it. But then all of a sudden they started doing, um, they started running lie detector tests on people and people started failing the lie detector tests. And then slowly it came out, well, either either you were making the story, either people were making the story up or they were seeing that kid in the gorilla costume. One thing to note though, there are quite a few Bigfoot sightings in that section of, of Michigan. So it's possible there were a couple actual legitimate Bigfoot sightings mixed in there. But it was it was a cool story, and and even there was a, there was a little uh, restaurant there, a diner that served Monroe Monster Burgers for a while, and there there was also a car wash, which is cool. That's something else that Minerva Minerva also has that or had that back in the seventies. There was a restaurant that had uh, Minerva Monster sandwiches or something, and then a local car wash had uh, had a slogan on their sign about. You know, the Minerva monster getting his car washed at the, the car wash or whatever. Any other questions? Yeah. Have you ever investigated the Kentucky Goblins case? Or do you have any way to of that? It's, it's one of my favorite stories, and it's one that I would love to do a small town monsters film on the biggest issue we have is that there's no, there aren't really any original witnesses left um, I spoke to a member of the family last weekend um, and I, I was kind of trying to figure out if there's some way we could do the movie without them but there really isn't it's such a short-lived sighting story too um, but it there's a, there's a movie that just came out called invasion of Kelly um, that, that kind of is all about, it's a dramatized, you know, movie about the, the actual Kentucky um, Hopkinsville, Kelly Hopkinsville Goblins. And it, it is a great story. It's, it's super creepy. It's, it always reminds me of the Ford incident story from, from the Falcon Monster from The Legend of Boggy Creek. It's kind of got some of the same aspects. People hold up in the shack, they're being besieged, only in this case, instead of a rampaging Bigfoot, it's a, a bunch of tiny little ETs. But I do love that story. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not going to get through it. Any, any more questions? Yeah? I don't know if this is too broad of a question, but do you 
you think, do you see any distinction between this kind of local folklore and actual mythology other than the stretch of time between this invention and the description of it? I, th I think we're witnessing the birth of modern mythology in a lot of cases. You know, I mean, it's, it's hard to say because it's so, it's so relatively new, you know, compared to, but you, in the actual creatures themselves, I don't necessarily, maybe in the case of like the wood woes and how you can connect it to Bigfoot, but I think if these stories are remembered um, over time, they'll probably turn into something, you know, there's, there was the god Bigfoot who, who lived in the mountain with the, you know, it'll be like Greek mythology or something. I, could, I definitely could see this as the, the kind of birthplace of, of a modern mythology. Anything else? Yeah, you guys plan on doing it. There's not a lot of difference between a creature making the town famous and like a paranormal event making the town famous. Case in point, Amityville. Mm -hmm. Are you guys going to explore anything like that? Are you going to stick with creatures? <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're definitely branching out into that kind of thing. We, we've got, um, for, um, not unfortunately, but for Monsters of the Midwest, it's going to remain kind of Bigfoot oriented. There's a couple other non-Bigfoot non mixed in there. But um, beyond that, we have one very, we're going to do Bell Witch at some point. So, so, so um, definitely at some point, we're going to move beyond, um, don't tweet that out. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move beyond solely like Bigfoots and cryptids and stuff like that. And I would even say that Mothman kind of took us into that territory because it is such a strange case. You know, I don't know. There, you'll see in the movie, but it's not. You'll see in the movie. I don't want to get into it actually. But I definitely, and that's something we wanted to do for a very long time, and it's something we've had our eye on doing for a very long time. Um, in fact, we were talking way back, um, Brandon and I, when we were first kind of conceptualizing the whole thing, we were talking about doing stories about mass murders, you know, like a local, because it all kind of plays into the same thing as in a small town. Um, it's all open, open territory for us, so eventually, yes. Where am I at on time, by the way? 7.20? 7.22, guys, I killed this. Like a 12 minute talk and an eight minute, all right. Any any more questions? Yeah. Definitely. If we can raise the money for that, I will. I will run out of the country um, at a moment's notice. I would. I would love to do that. Again, it all comes down to financing and how we fund the movies. Everything is independently funded. I probably should have mentioned that. Everything is independently funded through Small Town Monsters. And the way we do that is through crowdfunding on Kickstarter. Um, the next Kickstarter launch is January 26th, and that'll fund our next like three projects next year. So we're, we're reliant on the people backing the Kickstarters, and then whatever we can make off the movies to fund the next movies and things like that. So it's it's kind of self-propelling itself. What's cool about that is continuing to watch it grow over time because it has grown, um, and and that's all thanks to the people that back those those Kickstarters. So definitely, if we can get to a point where we could go do, there's something that jumps to mind. Our poster artist, Sam Sheeran, actually, he's from the UK and he has a story over there that he is dying to tell about his own local monster. So maybe at some point we'll get to something like that. I saw another hand up in here. Yeah. You have a brain to ask, like the Blair Witch. Do you all ever think about using like psychics or ghost hunters or to help with your investigations? Well, our, our, typically what we're doing is talking to people who lived the experiences. So while, while there are definitely in, you know, researchers and investigators that are involved in the story, it's, it's not necessarily about proving anything for ourselves or anything like that. It's more about capturing that history in a bottle and, and putting it out there for people in an exciting way that kind of draws them into that story and lets them know why the story is important to begin with. Um, if a psychic or something like that was actually involved in that initial story, we would definitely talk to someone like that. And I think I've even interviewed someone who claimed to be a psychic for one of our, our projects. And something I should probably mention is that Case Files, which is a YouTube 
series we're kicking off in November. Um, in the Mothman at Point Pleasant, we talked real briefly about injured cold and the, the Woodrow Derenberger sighting that happened on Highway 77. Um, in the movie, it's, it's probably in there for like a minute. And I found out that uh, Woody Derenberger's daughter lived near me. So I actually put together an interview with her and interviewed her about um, injured cold and his impact on her family and things like that. And it'll be a free YouTube episode. You can go on YouTube or, or it's also going to be on Amazon Prime and watch those. And if you want like a deeper dive into some of the little side rabbit trails we touch on real briefly in the films, that's where case files will come in. So that's my nerd side coming out. Like I'm super into this stuff, obviously, else I wouldn't be making these. Um, and But due to time constraints, a lot of the time you don't have an hour to devote to Andrew Cold in the middle of a Mothman movie, but I love that story. So that's where something like that comes in. I went and talked to Tanya Derenberger and we were able to tell a little bit about Andrew Cold's impact on the Derenberger family. And that, that will be the first, there's gonna be a two-part Andrew Cold episode that kicks case files off right at the beginning of November. Again, it's free, so there's nothing to lose. Is that it? Anything else? Anything? Am I missing? Yes. If you're, you're, um, you're interviewing people, how do you find the people who are your documentary? I mean, obviously, you know the Darren River name, but like, if it's like a boggy creek or someplace like that, how do you find the people who are your witness? With, with Boggy, I lucked out because Lyle wanted to be involved and he had already done all the research, so I didn't have to do any work. Um, for everything else, um, we, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I was a newspaper reporter for eight years, like freelance, and I've, I've always been mildly obsessive too about these stories, and I, I love the detective kind of aspect of it, you know, trying to find the witness and, and that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of tricks I use, including a white pages premium account <laughs> um, but, but for the most part it's tracking down names the most important thing for us is names we're working on the flatwoods monster movie right now and i found an old book about the flatwoods monster that no one seems to talk about but it was written before any of the modern books and this guy was claiming to interview uh people involved in the flatwoods case decades before there was anyone else really investigating it i spent probably three straight days trying to track down the author and then found out it was a pen name and then spent another two days tracking down how to get a hold of him and then found out he had died back in 2008. Um, so things like that happen a lot too. That's probably our biggest challenge as we're making these movies is uh, as time goes on we're losing a lot of the original witnesses. Um, you know, the past and things like that because it's been decades in some cases. So that that answers that so the movie's going to be starting here soon we're going to be outside signing so if you want to come out and get something signed or whatever and selling and you can come out and talk to us about what we got coming up immediately following the movie um we're going to do a a q a so if you want to stick around and lyle and zach and jason and brandon and i are going to be doing the q a so the movie's kicking off in like a half hour Right? Somewhere right around there. I didn't realize that was on when I started talking. All right. Uh, what you're about to watch is the Mothman of Point Pleasant. It's just what we were talking about a little bit. A ton of you came out and had us sign stuff. We're still going to be out there the rest of the night hanging on for you. So stop out, say hi, um, what have you after the movie. We're really excited to hear what you guys think of this. Um, and it's, you, you're the first kind of large scale audience in the world to see this together on a big screen. We held it specifically for this event, so we're pretty excited to kind of hear what you guys think of this. Um, it's a, that's a DVD menu. Pretend it's on celluloid. Just pretend. Like, just click, just ignore that. Um, the only thing I wanted to say, the movie was made for about $8,000. Um, and it, it was made by... Can you guys come up real quick, just so I can explain who everyone is real quick. We're, we're doing a Q&A immediately after the movie, so if you want to know more about the movie, this is the team that has made the last few. Um, yeah, it's a little bright. 
Um, so Zach is the director of photography and he shot the movie. Um, and it looks like MST3K back there, sorry. Um, Lyle Blackburn uh, is the narrator of the film and also the co-writer. Brandon Dalo did sound and the amazing uh, original score, which is available on CD actually outside. You guys are gonna love it. Jason Yudis kind of does everything. The, the most important thing about Jason is he remembers to have the people that we interview sign release forms. <laughs> so that's something I forget. So yeah, I, I, I'm really proud of this movie, really. And, and, and crazy coincidence, at this moment right now, uh, one year ago, I started principal photography for the Mothman of Point Pleasant. I was out here at Tuendui with my camera by myself shooting the Ohio River um, and some of those shots are in the film. So it's one year to the day that we started shooting the movie. So that's kind of a cool synchronicity. But thanks guys. I, I really hope you love this and, and we're really happy that we can show it to you tonight. Saw Mothman, Mothman Sniper saw orbs 
like had both kinds of spirits, like some like someone like her like a baby friend in the living room, door slamming and even escape her before seeing a green man in her room. Were you even find any like any figuring by interviewing by her baby room? I, sh I feel like I should have had you helping me write the movie. <laughs> You're like a wealth of knowledge. The the Scarberry stuff. Um, we we originally it was in my narration. There was going to be a little sequence about Linda continuing to have all that weird activity around her house after she moved back in with her parents because she she told stories about seeing poltergeist and weird or not seeing poltergeist but seeing. Um, weird men in black in the house, not men in black, not like, like MIB, but like a weird man in black around the house. There was also, she talked about phantom smells, like smelling, um, if I remember it, like cigar smoke in the house, even though no one had been there when they would come back and things like that. So there were, there were definitely a lot of those weird ghostly type things connected with that. You got something? No, the only other thing I can think of is Keel mentioned like phantom photographers as well, like around town with Linda, with John, and stuff like that, where there were people you know, run up and grab a picture and then run away, or they'd see flashes and things like that, like the camera flash. And we got one right here. Phantom, <laughs> Phantom, <laughs> Phantom, <laughs> Phantom <laughs> Flasher, that's what we call it. And, and just to know, that's, the, that's the, the challenge about filmmaking. I mean, is you, you have this story that has all these side notes and these other things that are fascinating. And it's like, where do you, you know, you have to make a narrative that's going to, to stay on track and to tell the story as a whole, but you always are going to have those other, all these other cool things you're talking about that you could, you know, you may find in books here and there, and, you, and to truly get the story, you know, you have to, you have to just study all these uh, you know, different writings and all the films and everything else. Yeah. No, you, oh, you okay. bring her. Sorry. Okay, well, kind of tangent to that um, is a Wamsley. Yeah, Wamsley. Wamsley. Uh, I think I mentioned like, you know, it's like 100 reports, you know, over the course. So has there been like any like, documentation like putting all that together? That's, that's kind of what Jeff's doing, but I think the, I think the problem with I th this is just from my own experience making the movie, not talking about anyone else's research. I had a really hard time finding these reports. And you hear a lot about, oh, there was like 200 reports and, and over this span of time. I don't find that many, personally. Um, I found like 30 or 40. That's not to say they're not out there. Keel definitely is, is talking about reports that you can't find documentation for today. What's weird about Keel's documents on the, um, the Mothman case is I, I contacted the guy that kind of keeps all the, the Keel archives. Um, he's, he's in the special effects, I think his name's Doug Skinner. Um, and I asked him about the Keel, pa like Keel's papers on the Mothman case. And he believes they were part of the files that were stolen out of Keel's car. Um, well, he mentions it in the Mothman Prophecies book. That someone broke into his car while he was in like Washington D.C. Yeah. Washington D.C. Someone broke into his car and stole all of his documents out of the car because he kept everything. I have heard Keel was very um, uh, messy; like his stuff was just all over the place. So he had a bunch of his stuff in his car was stolen. Apparently, a lot of that were were his Mothman files. But I would think if you could get access to to like hires. Um, archives and things like that, you might be able to find them. But again, I don't know the hire kept that stuff or if her family knows where that stuff is or if it got thrown away when she died. You know, it's, it's hard to say. So in some ways, people don't realize that we're going to be sitting here this many years later really looking at it and wanting to know every one of those. So there was nobody really, you know, Keel wrote his book, and, but nobody was meticulously trying to log those in any one central database, so they're, they get scattered. Well, so these are like um, all the local newspapers. The there, there are a lot in, in the papers that we didn't even get to in the movie. Um, and if you go, what's really interesting about Hire's column is she'll, she'll just like offhandedly mention some crazy story, like it's nothing, you know, and move on to the next part of her column. So there's all kind. I'm sure if you compiled all that, you'd probably come up with a couple hundred. But as far as like someone going out and gathering all that and putting it in one place, I don't know that anyone's done it definitively. I do think that's what Jeff is doing with the museum.
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Even in the book. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Question? Yeah, up there, young man. Um, do you believe in the like, whole alien? Did it just happen that his name was somehow English? <laughs> do I? Henry <laughs> Cole. And his name was English? He's asking, do you believe in Henry Cole? I talked to Woodrow Derenberger's daughter. Um, she was, she was, the, she's the daughter of Woody Derenberger. Woody's the one that met Cold that night. She claimed she saw Cold on multiple experiences, uh, multiple occasions, including at Woodrow's funeral in the 90s. Um, and I, I can't remember what year he died, but the family, um, the Derenbergers, are, are kind of split on this. Some of the Derenbergers are like, yeah, my dad was telling the truth. There definitely was an injured cold. Tanya, who I spoke to, really says she saw him, and the other half of the family kind of ignores it. I know that his ex-wife, uh, who was married to him at the time, went to her grave believing it happened. So, as for him having an English name, it's weird. It's very weird. <laughs> yeah, cool name. It is cool. Name. It's creepy. Me. Name. Me. Yeah. Um. How do you go about depicting the Mothman in art in a way that's accurate to the witness's description? Mike. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, basically, I just tell my artists, hey, um, I want you to do this scene, and then I will give them, the. usually I'll give them either the audio or the video from talking to the witness about that description. What on this movie was different was Brandon Scalf did those weird like ink drawings mm -hmm. of the they're, they're kind of like a Bigfoot Mothman. It's, they're really cool. I, I actually love his take on that. And, I'm, and I've talked to some people who are like, well, there's no descriptions that match that. And I'm like, it's not necessarily true because there were sightings in the in the TNT area of hairy, upright, running Mothman type creatures later on in 67. <laughs> uh, hunters, a couple hunters actually said they saw something that matched that visually. And this movie, it was more like just put, you know, like put the best representation you can of what the witnesses saying they saw on screen. Um, and, and then in the case of Chris Scalf, who did the animated, like the fully animated, like painted and animated, he was kind of combining everything. So he, you know, at the, while you definitely want to be faithful to what the witnesses saw, a lot of the witness descriptions are a little fuzzy. Like the, the physical, the physical, um, physical characteristics of the creature don't always line up. So in some of the cases, it's just letting the artist kind of do their interpretation of what people were seeing. Yeah, that's another question. Yeah, man. Uh, middle. Here. Me. Um, another question is, what do you think it means when these sort of local legends appear elsewhere in the world? Like when they're sighted elsewhere in the world? What do you think it means? Like... When, when these local legends go global? Yeah, like when Mothman is seen in Chicago or whatever. What do you think it means when uh, like a local legend is seen somewhere else? I mean, it's... It, it could be two things. It could be that the Mothman has become such a pop cultural icon mm -hmm. that someone in Chicago sees some unidentified thing in the sky and just says, I saw a Mothman, and then it, it takes off. You know, mm -hmm. so they, they tell a friend, then, then more people start hearing about it, and suddenly everyone wants to have their own encounter with Mothman. So anything they see that's weird in the sky suddenly becomes Mothman because that's what is popular right now. Um, or it could be that people are seeing a Mothman in Chicago. I don't know. I mean, there, there's all kinds of these. I mean, Mothman is the most famous, but there's winged humanoid sightings that occur all over, really worldwide. I mean, and there's other cases like that people probably don't know. The Houston Batman, for example, from Texas, where I'm from, some credible witnesses saw a sort of a human-like creature crouched uh, that had wings. So it's hard to say if, if those people even knew what the Mothman was if back in the, in the day when they saw that, if it influenced them or simply there's these unexplained things in other parts of, of the world that just didn't get the Mothman prophecies treatment, which made this one ultimately much more famous. Uh, yeah, up there. Yeah, you know, it sort of down the fact that 
like even the depiction behind you right now, the Moss Man, is almost demonic in nature. I mean, put thought into that. I I definitely have thought about all the different possibilities connected with with Mothman, and when you when you hear an account like Lawrence Gray's, which is that he saw the devil standing in his room, basically, you you got to wonder. We also there's a scene that we cut out of the movie Marcella Bennett in this, you know, like the way we shot that interview, going through the with projecting her interview on the TNT uh, on the inside of the TNT bunker and all that. Later on in that interview, she starts talking about how she's convinced what she saw that night was Satan. So, I mean, it's it's definitely a possibility. What's strange is it doesn't necessarily line up with other people's accounts of what they saw. And that's what's so weird about, not just Mothman, that's weird about a lot of cryptids. Um, but especially Mothman. It, do, it does not seem that a lot of the witnesses' descriptions are necessarily what the next guy saw. So that is kind of bizarre. What, what does what does kind of go across a lot of those, especially the ones where they see it fly or take off, is that it just went straight up in the air. I did, you don't read a lot, or I don't know that I read anywhere they said it, they saw it flapping wings or anything when it took off. So that is kind of curious. And you, you just get into these archetypes where as soon as somebody says it had, has red eyes, then it, it becomes evil and demonic. You know, it could, it could be bioluminescence or something reflecting from an actual animal. But then our, you know, our archetypes, all of our history and folklore and religion come into play. And as soon as you try to draw, do a drawing that looks dynamic and cool, that you went on a shirt, put red eyes on it, you've basically got a demon. So who knows if that's the true nature of the creature or if it's just what we're, we're applying because we're applying our own you know, inherent uh, beliefs. Just to see if anyone else. Okay. Right. <laughs> Let's do you, and then we're going to do one more question, I think. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think you know, one, two of what, what, what was Jerry Baker's friends apparently encountered these beings, and apparently they stole their shoes and stuff. And you know, it, and then like the next morning, the kids were charmed and stuff. I mean, and the only thing that sounds like sounds like a, a fairy kind of like. Were you ever interviewed these friends or talked to these people? Do you know of any other witnesses who claim the similar, so similar stories about them, which seems like you know, which type of like a fairy encounter? No, I mean the only the only one I've got is from Tanya, from from Woody's daughter, and she she did tell me that while all this was going on in '66, that behind their house there were constantly lights in the sky, and her dad Woody would tell her that those were the land you. The, Lanyu, the people from Lanyulus uh, watching over the family and not to be afraid of them, that they weren't there to hurt them. You know, I mean, Woody, Woody went off the deep end for a little while there. I mean, he was, whatever happened, he was disappearing for weeks at a time and claiming that he was going to visit with cold on Lanyulus. Um, he'd come back. Tanya's accounts of what happened does not seem supernatural or paranormal it seems very common she, she told me a story about like um cold and his wife and kids coming over for dinner and eating mashed potatoes like it's very different from what you read or hear about in pop culture and we get a little bit into this in the case files episode about it there seems to be some like there's there's a disparity here between what tanya who i tend to believe a little bit more than just reading random stories because Tanya was there. Her 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 account of what happened is very commonplace, on, and and she does believe they were aliens and all that. But it's it's just so matter of fact, like when she talks about them. And 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 also she does not believe the she doesn't like the grinning man idea. She says he did not walk around with like this creepy grin on his face, and um, she said he looked Hispanic. So it wasn't that he was he had a creepy look or anything. She said he just looked. Hispanic man uh, who occasionally did look like he was trying to fit in, you know, with human beings. So let's do let's do one more question. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you. So, uh, do you know what kind of creatures are you uh, here in in West Virginia? I don't, but I know that there was just one in Chicago a few days ago. Um, there's a guy named Lon Strickler who's really tracking all the the uh, the Mothman reports around Chicago, 
Um, what's interesting about the Mothman reports is a few of them have been, mm -hmm. or the Chicago ones, a, a few of them have been police officers off duty. Um, and that's kind of cool. And there's been multiple witnesses. Brandon went to the area kind of to check it out where they were claiming to see stuff. You know? Yeah, I just, I just moved to Los Angeles uh, like four months ago and I drove from Cleveland all the way there. So I stopped in Chicago just to check it out. But um, I, I found a map, I think Trick could put it together, but of all the, the recent Mothman sightings. And so there were two, like in this, very close to each other. So I went over there and I found it kind of like incredible and not in a good way because every there's skyscrapers all around, right? It's, it's a very heavily touristy area where these, these two happen. You gotta, I can't imagine that you basically have a 360 view of everything. People in the skyscrapers and on the ground, everybody walking around and things like that. There, there would be some kind of picture of footage that but you know, who knows? I don't know. But it's being seen all through the city. But like I said, you think it'd be like some kind of a rural spot city or something. Yeah. It's happening in like where these sightings, according to this map, is like it's right in the downtown area of Chicago. So it's definitely interesting. It's legit. And maybe a small town monster. Small town monster. <laughs> <laughs> future. In Mothman of Chicago. <laughs> all right. Let's wrap it up, guys. Uh, there's a lot of hot people in here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a question for you though. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you seen the November 20th, 2016 sighting? Because that guy in there, he asked, like, what was the most recent sighting? Yeah. And you said you weren't sure. Yeah. Like, have you heard about that one? No, no, but the other the other thing I forgot about was I actually talked to two more, like, recent witnesses, one from 2009 and another from 2011. And they were going to be in the movie, and then I was like, you know what, like, yeah, just, just keep I it to the 13 smaller. months. Yeah, I, I wanted to keep it to the 13 months, and also I felt like it would have been real weird to jump out of the, like, historical stuff, and then all of a sudden you're back into, like, more sightings. Mm -hmm. What's that? Uh, 15. Okay, another thing is, um, the, the form of the sightings, November 12th, 1966, the, there was a sighting in a cemetery where they were digging a grave, right? Yeah. Um, I've actually been to that cemetery. Did you know, like, what cemetery it was? It's, no. it's Coots I've Cemetery. I've driven by the exit for Clendenin, but I didn't, mm -hmm. didn't go. Yeah, I know she just used, like, a photo. You didn't, like, uh, when it comes to locations, do you think that's, like, an important thing? Yes. Or is it... Yeah, and usually we do. One, one thing that gets screwed up for us sometimes is that we're making the movies on, like, no money. Yeah, I know. So, so like, yeah, it was literally, really cool. like, sometimes we have a hard time even getting back to the location. The other thing is, like, sometimes we just end up with too much and we can't shoot it. Yeah, it's... Yeah, sometimes you don't know what the location is. Yeah, and it's super important to me to get to the actual location. We tried to find the location in the, where Marcella's sighting happened here. Yeah, this is a very vague sort of thing, like a house near the TNT area. a random house in the TNT area. Mm -hmm. um, there's... Uh, uh, Randy, is it Randy Thomas? One of the Thomases is still in town. And one of the kids that was, you know how like when Marcella went over there, there was yeah, a kid were kids that inside. Night? Randy was one of the kids who's still alive. That's awesome. We tried to get his story in the movie. And he was, he was, he, I also had like a thousand dollars to be in the movie. I didn't want anything to do with it. And Tom, oh, yeah. Without actually talking to people myself, I have no idea. Shoot. Scarberry's mallets. Mallets are still alive. Mm -hmm. They're still here. We, Jeff and I got together three grand to offer them for a half hour. Oh, man. Some of these people just don't want to do it and you lose, you lose any chance of talking to them or ever finding out. Um, here's another question then, because uh, you did a lot of research. Do you have any idea where the, the car is, the 57 Chevy? Would you know where that is? Like, like I've been wondering That's a really where it's good been. Question. That's like the Holy Grail. He loved that car, too. He might still have it, because he's still alive. Yeah, he I want lives in Tennessee. Yeah, I want to know if anyone was able to track that down. Like, if he sold it, like, look through some sort of record to find the actual car. You know, Jeff might. Have you asked Jeff? Uh, I've asked his wife, but uh, I haven't asked him yet. Jeff might know. Because Jeff talked to me a little bit about that car. Mm -hmm. I feel like he might still even have it. That'd be he's cool to he's see that. super cantankerous guy. Like mm -hmm. I don't know. And he said there was. Be like the Elvis <laughs> <laughs>
Project Scarberry? Yeah. yeah. Uh, he won't talk about the signings anymore? No. Be, like, do you think maybe if you offered them money for just like an affidavit, sort of like, I saw them off, man, they would do that? No. Uh, not at all? No, and that's really, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But no, Scarberry or the Mouths have nothing to do with it on any level. Okay. Which is really curious. Mm -hmm. So that car also, they said it had scratch marks on it from the, the actual sighting. It'd be cool if that was there. But, you know, it's been so many years, probably that would be not. You can ask Faye about that. She's going to be down here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Faye, you'll report? Yeah. Okay. She's cool. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. Did you know your name has 13 letters in it? Seth Reed oh, yeah. That's pretty cool. It's creepy, too. A lot of the, the witnesses do, too. Yeah. Like Mary Mallet and stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, another thing that happened on the way down that I had never realized. I was married before. Mm -hmm. uh, before my wife. So my ex-wife, on our honeymoon, we stayed in Mineral Wells. On, like, the first night of our honeymoon, we were driving down south. And we were like, super late in the day, and we only made it this far. We stopped in Mineral Wells, and that's where the Derenbergers lived. Yeah. Which I never knew until now, so that's kind of great. Mm -hmm. A lot of weird coincidences. Yep. Um, another thing, have you seen? I got a lot of questions. Uh, have you? Here's one. Have you seen my website? I have a website, the Mothman Wiki, and like when you search for Mothman, it pops up a lot. So I want to know if you've ever seen it during your research. The yes. Mothman Wiki. Yeah, that's you. Yeah, that's me. Have you used that? Yeah. Cool. In nice. fact, I think I was at your site probably more. In fact, I had your site printed off. Nice. And my wife used it to help me put together the timeline scenes, the scenes that... Yeah, the Mothman timeline. I actually had a page well, not, for the Mothman timeline. But the way we have like the, our timeline in the movie, yeah. we were using... We would like go back to your website to double check dates to make sure I was... Nice. I always wondered who that was. So that's <laughs> you. I'm glad that was helpful. That is I awesome. went through like a lot of the stuff and made sure I had like the sources at the bottom. I tried what to always do it. Uh, I don't know. Merch. Yeah, I already have the uh, merch. Did you, get, did you get anything other than that? Did you buy an SDM shirt? Uh, nope. I need to get one. Let me get point. you one. Give it to you. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Here you go, man. Thank you. Take it. Yeah, uh, he had made a. Uh, what do you call it, like a bulletin board? Yeah, the, the Cryptozoology Museum. Have you seen that? Yeah. That, that's mine too. I made that. Yeah, I, I, it always bugged me that in any of the documentaries or anything, there was no definitive chronological timeline about it. Mm -hmm. So, like, we were just trying to quickly do that. But we referred to your wiki constantly. And I printed it off when I. We always do a meeting because Zach and Jason, they're not into this stuff. So when we, whenever we have to pick a subject, I always print off a bunch of research online and give it to them so they have stuff to read. And I gave them printed copies of your site. Cool. That's really cool that that was you. Mm -hmm. What's okay. your name again? All right. Cool. Mm -hmm. I go by Mothman Historian online. Yeah. You're on Twitter and stuff too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keeping the folklore alive. Yeah. Awesome. Keep okay. at it. He knows you stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like, hey, this is, this is he's the kid that does the Mothman Wiki. Oh, sweet. And all that I'm stuff. following you on Twitter. Oh, right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I was like looking up your stuff as we were, I was doing research. Yeah. That's it's cool. Good. I told you, dude. It's good, good resource, dude. Sure. Unless you just nice. pull on your leg. We, we no, refer to that more than almost anything. I mean, it's it's like one of the most complete resources on the mm -hmm. that you can find online. Yeah. Yep. So that's cool. Yeah, thank you. I follow you on Twitter. Definitely, yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> I like that. That's one thing about it. He pays very close attention to detail. Yeah. He tries to make sure he's thorough on everything he does. That's cool because, you know, there's somebody should be putting together all that information in one place. So, I appreciate that you know. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Are you from here? And yeah, I'm from West Virginia. I'm not from Point Pleasant, though. It's a beautiful area, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I like it, man. It's cool stuff. Yeah, this is, this is such a fascinating case. I can I can sort of understand why, you know, why you got into that mm -hmm. and started doing that.